in this video, how strong exactly are these babies and do you need to worry? All inspired by a question from you. Now, they're pretty strong, but yeah, you do need to worry. However, not for the reason you might think. I'm Julian Logan from AutoExpert.com. Are you and I get new cars? Hogan! Cheap, Australia only, website, card. Now, we'll get into this in just a sec. It'll be the full-on ghetto engineering material science deep dive into these babies, how they work and what you need to be concerned about. The mechanics of actual injuries when people use this stuff, getting themselves crushed to death and things of that nature, which is, you know, just so juicy and uplifting. <laughs> Literally not uplifting in the case of crushing yourself, is it? However, I just wanted to countenance a couple of recent comments from you. Now, if you don't want to endure this stuff, I'll put a time code somewhere, possibly about roughly there in the frame, so that you can skip forward and not have to deal with the issue of deleting a memory that you no longer want to store. You're welcome, dude. Comment number one from a chap or chapette named Ptolemac. 21, who has an issue, apparently, with me using the term Christian name. Ptolemac21 says, <coughs> Christian name? Really? Don't you mean first name? No, I don't. I mean Christian name because that's a language convention. Languages don't have to be literally true in every case. We've been using the term Christian name and surname to define the language of naming conventions in this neck o oh, the woods for donkey's years. I fail to see how it could be interpreted as even vaguely offensive to continue to use it. And I don't think we should just randomly change the language because a small group of people express a little bit of fake outrage about it because that would be absurd. It's a downward spiral, thin end of the wedge, slippery slope, all of that stuff, isn't it? It would never frigging end if we started. And I've got skin in this game. I could object to the term Christian name being a paid-up card-carrying member of the largest single religious denomination in this country, which is none, according to the last census. So there's that. I still don't think we should change the convention, however, because it works. Literal meanings are not offensive. If you want to get wound up about something, I'd suggest be concerned about the kinds of places on earth where if you're an apostate, you get put to death, for example. Because if this is the front line of the battle for equality, then ceasefire time, dude. Like, come on. And appeasing the woke is just ridiculously nauseating. Every time I think about how far one would have to ultimately bend over to eliminate offence from dialogue, if somebody wants to be offended, then it'd be well beyond the position that your ankles were, you know, readily accessible wrist-wise, wouldn't it? You know, you'd be fully bent over by the time we appeased everyone. So my solution to that is let's not try. And the second one is... Joseph Breda, Joe Bread, who says, I wish you would leave all the BS out of your segments would be much better viewing. Well done, Joseph. Two sentences for the price of one. I hate it when the education system leaves someone behind. Now, what I'd say about that kind of thing is, if you got a hundred Joe Breads all together and you put each of them in the cone of silence and you let them go full on executive producer and you got them to write down the definition of the BS that I should leave out because it would be so much better if I did, you'd have a hundred different things that would have to be left out because so many people say, oh, I love your reports, but I hate the politics. I love your reports, except you're a bit of a misogynist from time to time. I love your reports, except for the swearing. It just brings down the whole tone of the fucking discourse kind of thing, right? The point is, I'm not going to go down the track of appeasing the woke. The reality of YouTube is that there is, in practice, an infinite number of videos for you to watch, dude. And if you don't like mine, 
I promise not to give a shit if you don't watch, okay? I'm just going to be who I am, and you have to cop it, including the bits that you don't like. So I'm not going to leave out the BS. The BS is in. And long may it reside in these videos. It would make Australia less shit. <laughs> Let's talk jack stands now. I have an excellent question from a dude like you named Mario Della Riva, who says, I'm a DIYer and I'm always respectful of the car's desire to ruin my day. Good place to start, dude. I'd suggest the car wants to kill you. Every machine in the shop wants to kill you. You've got to take appropriate countermeasures and just, you know, keep it behind bars kind of things. Mario goes on and says, Question, I've always heard that the pin inserted in the teeth of the jack stand is essentially taking the load. Is this correct? That's always made me a tad nervous. So let's talk about that. The first point I'd make here is that you just have to accept that engineers do a pretty good job making absurdly dangerous things reasonably safe. And if you'd like evidence of that, just have a look at any servo, any refueling station anywhere on earth. Like... That is the most dangerous thing that ordinary people do, interacting with that chemical, like Jesus. If we weren't doing it and all of a sudden someone thought that was a good idea, there'd be a billion reasons why ordinary people could never go within 50 feet of gasoline, okay? And yet, people do it without thinking and it's entirely safe. It's very difficult to hurt yourself refueling, and that's purely the result of systematic protections in place. It's got nothing to do with people being mindful of the danger while they are on that particular job. So you also have to accept that these materials, you know, steel and cast iron, they're a lot stronger than you think. And I'll just give you an example of that, right? This is an M12 stud. So M12 would be a bit bigger than three-eighths and a little bit less than half an inch kind of thing if you're in America. And I guess this is about a class 10.9 fastener, let's say, for example, that it is. The proof load for this is about seven tonnes. It's 70 kilonewtons if you... I uh, want to go a full Isaac Apple on the head about it, okay? And the minimum tensile strength of a class 10.9 M12 fastener is 87.7 kilonewtons, which is about just shy of nine tons, let's call it, okay? And I, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be that comfortable about hanging four Hiluxes off this one stud, and certainly that would not be recommended, but... It's just, I just give this information over to sort of illustrate just how strong these reasonably mundane materials are. The reason that they don't hang four Hiluxes off something like this is it's just a little bit close to the edge. And engineers like being conservative because it's just a good way of ensuring that not too many people die on the job kind of thing. So the, the next thing I'd suggest is that the mechanism, like you've got to appreciate the mechanism and what it is. And this is a ratchet mechanism. We'll get to that in just a sec, but ratchets are kind of a one-way street, right? You have to disengage them to let them back off. And the way a ratchet works is just like a saw blade, dude. It's like a saw blade that allows one-way movement, okay? Like you can go that way really easily, but if you try and go the other way, this thing digs in and it won't go. So slide that way, can't slide the other way. There's your basic ratchet. In order to go the other way, you have to disengage, move, re-engage, repeat, okay? And that click you hear with your ratchets, it's exactly the same here, right? It's exactly the same here. Not as aggressive a ratchet, obviously, it's exactly the same here as well. It's exactly the same mechanism. So the clicks you hear in every case are the locking thing, which is called a pawl, P-A-W-L, not like the Christian name, Christian freaking name, and it's just sliding like that over the teeth, which is exactly the same as this. There's your teeth, pawl in there, job done. There's a whole bunch of things that can make the pawl work, right? 
you've got ratcheting mechanisms in your handbrake in some cars, a lot of cars that are still on the road, not so much modern ones, they tend to be automated now, but you've got a ratcheting mechanism just like this for the parking brake on your average trailer with brakes, right? It works exactly this way. Gravity does the work with the pole in this case. You know, a spring does the work with the pole in this case. A counterbalance and gravity does the work in this case because gravity acting on the handle causes the pole to lock and you have to disengage the load and release gravity from the mechanism so that you can reset the jack stand, right? So all of that makes kind of absolute sense, at least to me. And the other thing to remember is that there's a pin in this one, which is a secondary safety device. So you get it set up, pin goes through, you're ready to get under. I did some calculations, okay? And basically you have to remember that this pin here is loaded in double shear if you take the pole out of play, right? It's loaded here in shear and here in shear. So you've got 107 square millimetres here and 107 square millimetres here. There's probably a little bit of bending in the centre as well, but we can forget about that just for the purpose of this analysis. It's not likely to be that important, right? And I did some back of the envelope calculations on that. Five and a half tonnes is the kind of load that even the cheapest, shittiest grade structural 250 MPA yield strength steel would deliver if the mechanism, the primary mechanism fails and the pin is back to holding the whole shebang up over you, five and a half tons. And if it's some sort of normalized tool steel instead, like uh, 1080 or less likely, sort of 4140, you'd be looking at eight to 12 tons of load before the pin would yield. And you've got to remember in all of these cases, five and a half tons for the cheese of steel and eight to 12 tons for a higher grade of steel, the pin doesn't fail when it yields. It just bends permanently. It's probably going to endure another 15% more load before it fails. The thing about reserve parachutes, right, is that it's really good if you never have to pull that ripcord. But if you do, I'd suggest this is a hell of a reserve parachute to have. And the other thing to think about is the fundamental materials and construction here. I mean, this is sheet steel that's been laser cut, folded and fully seam welded. It's reinforced where it needs to be reinforced. And the main body of the column is made out of cast iron, as is the pole just inside here. And the pole is held onto the handle by a roll pin. And you might be saying, isn't cast iron a bit shit? Isn't that a cheap option? And I get where that sentiment might come from, but I'd suggest that no, cast iron is not a bit shit, not necessarily anyway, we'll get to that. It's available in two basic flavours. There's the more common kind, which they make weight plates out of and drainage grates and things of that nature. And then there's this kind, which looks exactly the same, but it's called ductile iron, right? And as the name implies, ductile iron is far more tolerant of the slings and arrows of impact and shock loading and uh, operational things of that nature. If you're going to make parts for a big fat bulldozer in a mine or anything like that, or a jack stand, it needs to be made out of ductile iron, which is a fantastic material. Not that grey iron's not fantastic. If I was going to make a big fat welding table, I'd get a tonne and a half of grey iron and pour it into a slab and then get the world's biggest fly cutter to machine the top and drill a bunch of holes in it. And that would be awesome because grey iron is just the best material to weld on. It's resistant to the adhesion of BBs and all of this kind of thing. You know, it's, it's a great material for that. But not so much for anything that is going to be loaded or that might be subject to brittle failure without warning, which, which this would be if it was made out of grey iron. Essentially, there are two tests for grey iron versus ductile iron that you can do in the field, and they are both pretty definitive. The first test is just a centre punch and a hammer. And if you're going to do the test, do it somewhere that doesn't matter. Like, test the end of this shaft, not the business end that actually carries the load, but the end down here that's never going to be subject to any forces, okay? And that's on you. 
if you do any testing of this nature, I have to say. But the simplest test that is the least destructive is you just get your uh, big fat center punch and you find a part on the part that you want to test that is not structurally significant. So it's away from anywhere that's ever going to bear any load and you just get yo hammer and you give it a decent hit and then you do the fingernail test, right? And you've got to think like microscope, man, like we're down on the surface of the moon and we're looking at a crater from a meteor impact or something, right? The edges are raised and there's a divot in the centre. And if that's the case, if the topography of your centre pop hit gives you a crater like on the moon, then your fingernail catches on the edge of it and you can feel it. And it is almost certainly ductile iron, not the brittle kind. Okay, the brittle kind never raises a burr when you center pop it. It just kind of falls apart and it leaves a, a flat surface with a dent in it. Okay, and that is substantially different. The other kind of test you can do, which I have done to this, is you drill down into it. You spot drill and again you do it in a bit that doesn't matter. And you just look at the chips that come off. And if they are those triangular shaped chips, like fully formed metal chips that are more like when you drill steel, but not quite like when you drill steel, then this is ductile iron. Whereas if you drill into a piece of gray iron, all you get is like powder or filings. You don't get fully formed chips. And this leads me, both these tests lead me to the conclusion that this is a really robust piece of equipment that is highly unlikely to fail as long as you're not a complete operational Muppet. So I suppose we should talk about that because back in 2016, the ACCC did a bit of investigation on this and they did a thing that they titled, mouthful, review of the mandatory safety standards for hydraulic trolley jacks, vehicle support stands, and portable ramps for vehicles. Now, a lot of this is eyes glaze over regulatory stuff, but there are two bits in this that I'm gonna read out to you, right? And part number four in this report says deaths and injuries, okay? Since the year 2000, so that's for 16 years worth of data, an average of five Australians each year has been killed at home from vehicles falling on them while they were performing maintenance underneath the vehicles. Coronial and police investigations indicate these deaths occur through the incorrect use of these products and when consumers use unstable alternatives such as bricks and wooden blocks instead of vehicle support stands. So this basically says that people are using something like this on an unstable surface that won't support the load or they're not using something like this at all and they're just using bricks or blocks or they're supporting a vehicle on a jack and just getting under it, which is also a ridiculous thing to do. They go on and say, although national figures are not available, Victorian hospital data indicates an average of 43 injuries presenting at emergency departments each year. Injuries range from the more common open wound, strain and crush injuries to less common but more severe injuries such as traumatic amputation, which doesn't sound like much fun, does it? And uh, further on in part seven of this report, they say that the mandatory safety standards have been successful in improving the safety of these products and the jacks, right, and ramps. The main cause of injuries and fatalities is no longer the failure of products such as this. Coronial and police investigations indicate that most injuries and fatalities from raised vehicles occur when consumers use unstable alternatives such as bricks or wooden blocks instead of vehicle support stands. So I hope that this allies some of the fear out there about, you know, getting under and is the pin strong enough or is the pole strong enough? Like, it's pretty idiot proof. With all that in mind, the official investigation into mortality and injury and 
the material science and the design and the engineering of the fundamental components and things of that nature, what do you take away from this? You know, getting nervous about getting under the car and look at the size of the pin and this is made of cast iron and things of that nature. I'd suggest there's a couple of things, right? There's, there's really four points here. And the first one is you've got to look for the compliance statement. It should say AS2538. This is a mandatory standard. It's got to be there. Okay? And if it's not on any jack stand that you are looking at in a retail environment, then you should get onto a computer and complain to the ACCC because mandatory standards are there to save people's lives. Okay, And if you notice something not compliant, you should kick up a stink about it because that's properly dangerous or at least uncertain and it need not be this way. This stand is not that way. It fully complies. It's well made. It came from Auto One. Full disclaimer, they gave me four of them, plus a jack, and I'm free to use them any way I want. I don't get anything out of recommending them, although I can tell you that these are excellent products that are well made. And I'll put a link in the description if you're interested in acquiring something that might potentially be better than the dodgy way you are lifting your own car off the ground and getting under it right now, because you don't need to be the next statistic. The next point I'd say is that none of this is likely to fail. The primary mechanism is robust. And the secondary mechanism is a hell of a reserve chute, even though it really doesn't have to be there as I understand it. It's just a nice to have, okay? And unlikely to fail is a kind of engineering euphemism, right? It means I don't see how you're gonna break it, son, unless you're a proper dickhead, okay? I wouldn't be lifting up a bulldozer with something like this, but a Land Cruiser, patrol, something of that nature, it's gonna be fine. As long as you're on a stable surface, like a concrete surface, I don't see how you're going to make it fail. I don't see how it's going to fall over, right? Which leads me to the final point, and that is, what is the weakest link? And the weakest link is the biggest idiot. See, in all of this research here by the ACCC, they don't make any statements about the number of pissed idiots who woke up dead under their cars after doing it stupidly. But it's mainly happening at home and not in industry, which leads me to think that, let's face it, in it, fat caves all over the country, occupational health and safety compliance is variable. Let's put it that way. The message is that you don't have to be the next ultimate idiot supplied by natural selection right? You can make smarter decisions. You can, you can choose a safe environment. You can choose well thought out, well constructed devices that are unlikely to fail to save your life, right? You can choose to have them there or not. That's on you. It's especially on you at home. It's not wholly on you in industry. Like there's a process in place and other heads will roll if you wake up dead. But at home, it's entirely on you. So just don't be the next ultimate idiot in the conga line of ultimate idiots making it to the Darwin Awards and you remove the biggest risk when it comes to getting under a car associated with anything remotely like this.